Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the CISO's Most Wanted Fireside Chat. I promise you are surely in for a treat. My name is Frank Cotto. I'm a principal sales engineer with Progress and on with me today is Andy Redman, Progress's Director of America's Sales Engineering, Richard Barreto, Progress's Chief Information Security Officer, and our guest, Scott Augenbaum, former FBI Cyber Division Director. So before we kick off this highly interested fireside conversation, allow me to set the tone of our discussion. Expecting that the number of worldwide cyber attack attempts will subside in next year's reports is hopelessly optimistic. However, I believe that the metric that is in our hands is an organization's cost incurred at the result of a data breach. According to the 2023 IBM cost of a data breach report, organizations using AI tools to detect threats within their networks were able to contain breaches 108 days faster on average than those who were not. That ability equated to a savings of 1.76 million on average to organizations using AI to detect threats in their networks. Last year's projections for the total cost impact that data breaches would have on the world by 2025 was 10.5 trillion. Now, you don't need to dwell on statistics to conclude that threat actor success at circumventing perimeter and for that matter, endpoint protection is on the rise. It has never been more important to have an intelligent lens into threat actor present with presence within your network. The good news is that the network detection and response market continues to grow steadily, and suddenly threat actors have a hurdle powered by AI to address in real-time anomaly detection systems like Fulmon. With that, let's dive right into the questions for Scott. And gentlemen, feel free to comment and add your thoughts at any point in time. So Scott, can you share from your expert perspective on the challenges organizations today are faced with in securing their perimeter and endpoints, as well as how you believe NDR solutions or network detection, detection and response solutions today have an impact on protecting organizations from threat actor exploits? Absolutely. Well, let me set the stage with you guys. Andy, Rich, can you see the big smile on my face? That's because I'm retired from the FBI. <laughs> I've been retired for five and a half years, had an amazing 30 year career with the FBI, spent 25 years as an agent and 20 years involved in the investigation and response of cybersecurity. And I am so excited that you all uh, brought me here on to share my expertise with you. And you know, this is a question that we've been dealing with since the beginning of time. And you know, Frank, you made a really interesting statement before because you know, in 2025, the cybercrime problem is projected to be a $10 trillion problem. I remember in 2015, when I was an FBI agent in Nashville, Tennessee, dealing with some of the largest publicly traded companies in the state of Tennessee, explaining that the cybercrime problem was a $3 trillion problem in 2015. In 2016, the FBI, we were giving out guidance on emerging threats such as ransomware and the business email compromise. And during these presentations, I was telling people, look, 2021's coming around and we gotta be prepared because it's gonna be a $6 trillion problem. And what happened? COVID-19, and what did we all do? We spun everything up into the cloud. We didn't tell anyone about it. We just put things into the cloud and you know, hopefully, uh, Eventually, the security people would find out about it and the bad guys were popping it. So it makes me like, and now we're talking about 2025. So let's get on the same sheet of music, Rich and Andy. The problem's going up, right? It's 100%. Yeah, it's, not, yeah, it, it's, it's getting worse. And, and, you know, and during my career, and I want to kind of set the stage with this, you know, I touched a thousand cybercrime victims. And in each one of them, I learned the truth. These were the things behind the scenes. And this is what I want to share today. You know, I laid these out as the four truths. None of my victims ever expected to be a victim. They didn't think they had anything worth stealing. Why would anyone want to target me? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, I would hear. The second truth is when the cyber criminals steal your stuff, or if you get hit with ransomware, and we're going to talk a lot about ransomware, they steal your data. They steal your money. You contact law enforcement. We don't have a magic wand to fix the problem. Putting the bad guys in jail is the third truth. And that's really challenging because cyber criminals are located overseas. Majority of them are located 
Same places we were talking about since 2015, China, Russia, Iran, the business email compromise out of Nigeria working better than malware. And the fourth truth is during my career, almost 90% of what I dealt with easily could have been prevented. The other 10% is a little more challenging. And that's what we're going to dive into today as we talk about really what caused the breaches. You know, what I saw from my experiences. But if we don't get our act together, I mean, I think we're going to be talking about the same thing in five years from now. And that's really what I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, am I off base on anything that I'm saying? No, oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So yeah, we're not. We're still dealing with basics, right? I think that's where most companies are still struggling is with just with the basics, right? Getting good visibility, getting good protection mechanisms in place, good authentication mechanisms in place. But you know, a program is multi-layered and it's it's constantly evolving. And I think that's one of the challenges is that these attacks are evolving. Um, and I know we'll we'll talk more about that later. Yeah, and let's even talk about some of the attacks. I mean, I was just sitting here today and, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who worked for a large publicly traded company and he had to go overseas for part of the company in 2017 to deal with the non-Petra ransomware variant. 2017. Can you believe that was six years ago? Yeah, it feels like forever. And, yeah. <laughs> now with ransomware as a service, I mean... These are the things that we really have to bring the level of awareness to the C-suites. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna throw a question out there that, that's gonna be um, attention grabbing for certain, right? Because I, I think everybody joining this session really wants to gain some of the, uh, the, the very entertaining insights that you can provide formerly being with the FBI, right? So, so Scott, how often does the FBI contact companies to let them know that they had an intrusion as opposed to companies contacting the FBI to report a cybersecurity event and vice versa if the, if the opposite of true is, is true, of course. Well, you know, that in the work, when an organization has to decide, and this is why, you know, having an intrusion response plan is so important because it's the worst days, you know, and, and Rich, you can agree with me with your experience as a CISO, it's the worst day in the world when you have to make that decision to contact law enforcement, right? Yep. It's not an easy decision, right? It, it takes a lot of deliberation. You know, we, we question like, what's the value? Uh, you know, how can how can the FBI or any authority help? Uh, yeah. And it's it's hard, right? Because we're in an incident. It's yeah, it's the fog of war at that point, and so every decision has a has an impact, and so we have to be very careful when when to pick up that phone. And, and also remember, you as a CISO, to most of our information security people here. A CISO just can't pick up the phone and call the FBI, right? Absolutely not. Usually ends up going through legal, right? Like my, the decisions that I make always have to go through legal because there's us being a public company, we don't know what the, the downstream impact of litigation could be. And so everything has to be methodically thought through because it could be held against us. Oh, absolutely. So let's think about it. That's the company's worst day in the world. But think about this. It was a hundred times worse when I would show up at an organization and go like this. Hi, Scott Augenbaum with the FBI. I'm from New York. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Don't worry. But you have traffic leaving your network and it's going to a hostile foreign adversary. <laughs> Do you mind if we come in and we set up, with your consent, set up some network sniffing equipment so we can see the TTPs, the, the, the practical side of it, to see what is going on? First of all, yeah, my first question is like, how did you know that? <laughs> Yeah, that was always the first question was, how did you know? And it was and I, I'll sit back, I'll peel that back. But I but here's how it always went. It was like, first, it was denial. No, <laughs> it's still here. And I'm like, yeah, it's still here. How did you know? Why didn't you do something about this? And it was very, very simple. And this is the same thing, you know, there was a company that was victimized. We were looking at that company. From that company, 
all of their anything that was touching that company was going to the threat actors and they would always go well where did it go and i would always say to the company first do you know what was stolen because it left your organization in an encrypted raw file and it went out because and the first time i've ever seen something like this was 2008 where i actually watched the chinese government get into a healthcare organization not to steal bandwidth not to steal any property but to use that as an attack platform because let's think about this let's go back to 2008 or even today if you're a clear defense contractor and if you're a publicly traded company if there's traffic leaving your network at three o'clock in the morning and it's going to china russia or iran is that suspicious traffic Absolutely. Okay. What if there's traffic leaving your network at three o'clock in the morning going to a healthcare company? Is right. that just? It's not just. Yeah. That's the whole part. That's the whole part about it was the vis visibility portion. And let me tell you, everybody dusted off their intrusion response plan, and nobody ever told you what to do when the guy from the government comes down. And do you think the attorneys knew what to do right away? Absolutely not. What do you think? The, what do you think the response was? Hey, do you mind if we get your consent to put a sniffer on your network so we can see where the traffic is going? Absolutely not. <laughs> and you know what my response was? My this was victim notification. Best of luck to you guys. Yeah. We'd love to sit back, and this is the intelligence that I was able to gleam that I share with organizations today. So, okay, um, let, let's talk a little bit about that, right? It, obviously, you, you've seen a, num a very large number of these incidents and have dealt with, dealt through them and worked through them and, and have seen them during the array of, you know, legacy and modern um, technology platforms that were, you know, providing SecOps value and detection and so on and so forth. So. Let me just kind of put it this way. What what do you believe these organizations were missing, right? And, and maybe even form that into the, what do you wish those organizations had in place to not only have prevented the attack, but to made your job easier from the forensics perspective as well? Well, let's just go through it. None of these organizations when I would sit down really map to the core critical controls. They didn't know what was on their network. And Andy and Rich, if you don't know what's on your network, how do you patch what's on your network? Yes, but I agreed. You can't I mean, that's the, you can't the first, say. yeah, the first line, first line of defense is visibility and inventory of all your critical assets. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Your assets, because we all know patching is hard as it is. But when you you can't really patch what you don't really know, everybody yeah. was allowing any piece of software to run. And this was a couple of my favorite uh, questions that I had. Who and things have changed now. Hey, who has that? Who are your privileged users and who has admin rights? And a lot of times companies were I mean, I had public publicly traded companies go like this. Well, everyone does. Yeah. I was like, OK, and then they would have direct they would have these directories within these organizations and they would be shared directories. And I would go, do you have a list? Do you know who has access to the information? And they would go, no. And the other thing is, you know, they were looking at all these things and they were trying to block known bad. How do you block no, how do you <laughs> block known bad? Yeah. You really can't. Because all of a sudden, just think about that thing. I had all these clear defense contractors were all patting themselves on the back going, hey, we're not letting traffic come in from Russia, China, or Iran. So what did the Chinese, Russians, and Iranians do? Compromised computers here? Yeah. yeah. Or they uh, they I've, clown, I've, they? And I've seen that, right? In some of the incidents, right, is... They're using your, especially now with the cloud, is it's easy to pop up a system, make it look like it's coming for Virginia or Washington D.C. or like oh, you know, yeah. as an example of a healthcare company, and no one would question it. Yeah, 
And then we would see the threat actors would go out and spin up their own infrastructure in the cloud. So how does an organization end up blocking, you know, okay, maybe we're going to block Vulture hosting, which is a known bad site, which was, but how do you block that? So that's why that was another thing which was so important, the visibility. Because if they were able to see what was leaving their network, I don't think I would have been showing up. Sure. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it brings up a great point, right? There's on a number of, of customer engagements, you, you kind of notice a um, concerns that, are, that become heightened based on where you see traffic coming from. Uh, well, this country is suspicious or this is not on our allowed list of countries, right? And so, and even in the opposite, right? All right, well, this, this, is, this traffic looks anomalous, but it's coming from the U.S. So, we're okay, and it's like, wait, hold on a second, <laughs> right? I think I think you really need to think about diving deeper in, into the uh, to the the threat hunt here and the analysis here, because, like you said, right, these um, malicious entities are just going to mask themselves, and and they do it quite often. Um, and I have so. to just step in and say one thing, Frank. When you describe it to me as a customer engagement, mm -hmm. I just go like this: this was bringing the bad news, and. You know, Richard, as a CISO, I don't think you would call it a customer engagement on my side when I ruined your life. And not, not meaning I ruined your life, but when I brought you the worst news in the world. Yeah. 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 I, I guess it's a customer engagement when I'm equipping that customer with a product to prevent you from knocking yeah, on the door. No, no, I'm just laughing at that. That's what, no, you know, and I, and I have one goal here today, and this is why I'm so excited to partner with you. We need to think about this. We keep spending more and more money on different products and services, but when there were data breaches, I was bringing the bad news to people. Why was I bringing the bad news to people? Because things were leaving their network. Okay? It was just that simple. Yeah, I think Frank brought it up at the beginning, intro. Look, everyone's got a firewall. The vast majority have endpoint protection, but the vast majority don't actually have visibility. And if they had that level of visibility, they would be tooled to, to understand what's happening in the network. And I think this is a key thing that you're driving, Scott, is so, so with that said, the question then is all of your engagements, all of the bad news uh, experiences that you, that you came to these companies, how many of them had visibility? I mean, true visibility into what was happening in the networks. Back then, nobody was, you know, and here's the thing, they all, and this was back when the big fancy marketing buzzword was the layer seven firewall. Do you remember those days? Yep. So here's the deal. Yeah. Everybody had one, but nobody had an accurate inventory of what was on their network. Yeah. And nobody had an accurate visibility on where traffic was flowing. Should traffic be going here? Yeah. You know, should, yeah. and, I, and I've dealt with universities where all of a sudden, you know, 40% of their outbound traffic was going to China and 3% of their students were Chinese. Let me ask you guys, what do you think that means? <laughs> Not good news. You know, Scott, Scott, you bring it, I think we've, as an industry, have done very, really well with North and South traffic, right? Traffic leaving in and out your data centers. We've, we've done a pretty good job of that. But we all know that, you know, through acquisitions or through, um, um, through integrations with, with partners, contractors, data centers, you lose that visibility, what they call east to west traffic inside your environment, that insider threat. Because if I was an attacker, I'd find a test machine that no one's really paying attention to, compromise that, use that as a jump off point to another machine and use that as yeah. another jump off point machine. And oh, by the way, that next machine is where the privilege access you know, is, is happening. And now I can, I can take over those credentials and now hide my traffic by going to a healthcare company or to a payments industry company. Yeah. Without that visibility, you don't know and you can't trace the attack. Absolutely. I, I was just gonna say that that's that's just the reality today, right? Like Scott, you mentioned that back then no one had it. Um, granted, I'm sure today much more organizations have it, but it is still you know, shockingly small, the demographic of organizations that have NDR or intelligent NDR in place, 
Um, and it's, you know, if you really think about it just logically, right, if, if you know a threat actor's goal when they wake up in the morning is to figure out how to get past your perimeter or past your endpoint protection solution, then it's naive not to, not to put something in place um, to protect yourself if they are successful, right? Everybody focuses primarily on, all right, well, stop them from doing that. And that's a very important thing to, to attempt to do. Um, but, you know, the actual putting methods in, in place or, or solutions in place that are going to protect you if, in fact, they are successful, which, you know, numbers dictate they have been quite successful, um, is, is, I believe, naive, right? And so this is probably why we're seeing such a huge uptick in the, the NDR market, right? And so, um, guys, that, that leads me to my, uh, my next statement or question or thought-provoking uh, piece of information here that I, that I want to kind of highlight, right? And so a statement shared by a Gartner analyst, right, which has struck me to the effect that I cannot stop bringing it up on customer engagements and, and partner engagements is that detection and response is more important than blocking and prevention. Now, I think we'll be able to go around the table with comments and statements, but um, Rich, can you tell me first off, just so you can leave this out, what do you think about that statement, right? The section of response is more important than blocking prevention. Absolutely. Um, first of all, your last line of defense is going to be detection and response. It's having that visibility. When, it, when an incident happens, I need to understand and get that visibility. What's the blast radius, what we call the blast radius? How big was the damage? Did they touch this machine? That touch, did they touch that machine? And without that visibility, I, I'm lost, right? It's, it's basically, you're gonna have to go to every single machine, look at every single log, and then to try to bring that all together, that could take days or even weeks, depending on how big your environment is. Uh, in this day and age, because the attacks are evolving so quickly, and most CISOs will all agree, to, agree with me on this, is that it's not, yeah, we, we've heard this cliche, it's not a matter if, but when, and then what do you have? You, you want to have detection and tripwires so you can slow down the attacker, right? Or at least trip them up so that when your security operations center sees something, they can stop them at their tracks, right? Kill that kill chain, and then just kick them out of the network. Because again, these attacks are evolving so quickly, it's hard to be able to block and prevent everything. Now, good architecture and good, good strategy, yes, you can try and block and tackle all the big ones, but there's always going to be that one crack that you didn't think about or that zero day. How do you detect that? Absolutely. Yeah, look, Absolutely. I think you bring up some really great points, Rich. If you look at like over the past 10, 10 years, um, the numbers haven't really changed. 48% of orgs have had data breach. So not only has someone been in, they've been able to exfiltrate data out. So that's the person to your left to, to your right. And so, there's that old statement, evidence demands a verdict. The old tool says, you gotta have a firewall. You gotta have endpoint, we, we know that. You gotta preach the message internally to the organization. But if you don't have actual visibility to see what's going on in your network, you're, you're functionally blind, right? And so that's been a huge gap. And so organizations need to take a, I think a strategic focus at, at solving those problems. And I think you said it earlier, Scott, If if the, if the organizations that you were engaging with because you saw data leaving their network that they were completely blind to did have a layer of visibility, and we're talking broad-based visibility over the entire environment, you wouldn't be there, right? Your job would have been more simple. And, and that was, you know, and, and we're talking six years ago, and, and I just remember one of my first SANS classes, and I think it was Eric Cole, who was a pioneer in the, this, I just remember writing it down in SANS 401. That's the only thing I remember was prevention is ideal, but detection is a must. And six years ago, what did that mean? We had analysts. We were going through all these types of different, you know, you were wearing people out 24-7. And then, um, you know, we, we got to the point where now here we are 10 years later, there's a huge cybersecurity gap in this country. There's yeah. not enough people. And this is where the technology has to come in and the technology has to be robust enough with, as you said, the artificial intelligence to be able to make up that and to go like this. Hey, wait a second. 
why is this 125 megabyte RAR file leaving the organization at two o'clock in the morning from this privileged access account who never gets on to, who works traditionally between eight and five? Because here's another thing, when I was going out, all the vic all the traffic was being exfiltrated during Chinese business hours. Hey, look, you, you <laughs> raised a great point. And people will create these RAR, you know, these RAR files, but it's been interesting in our engagements where we've seen enterprise orgs that where data has been transferred from storage to an infected laptop, for example, that they're chunking it, they're taking large data. They're chunking it to say three to four hundred bytes, and they're attaching bytes that aren't encrypted or compressed or anything onto protocols like DNS requests, egressing the environment. That should, you know protocols that should never have payload. Uh, and so the methods by which some of these these threat actors are, are exfiltrating the data is incredibly creative. Yeah. Yes. You know, there, there, there's so much here, and, and that's just the big takeaway, because I'm going to be honest, like, you know, everyone's like, hey, Scott, you're out of the FBI five and a half years. How do you get your intelligence? I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's here. That's just a far of us, right? I go over. I have beers with my buddies in the FBI. I go, what's going on? They go, same stuff as six years ago. It's just a lot more. That's yeah. the end of the conversation. Yeah. So still, and, and I know there's a lot of advanced threats. I don't want to oversimplify the problem here, guys. But at the same time, we have to learn from our mistakes, or else we're going to be in 2025. And you know what we're going to be talking about? The problem's going to go up to a $15 trillion problem. People don't know where to start. That's my thing. They're always coming to me, and I'm like, Look, look at the core critical controls, look at those things, find something that will map to it. And if I went over and remember, we're not even talking about ransomware yet. We're not even talking about the simple things where all of a sudden, you know, I get called from an organization to have a really serious data breach because nobody put two-factor authentication on the Salesforce account and use the Salesforce account to... Uh, you know, attack all of their customers and it's a really serious account. I mean, I, I try to keep a straight face, but yeah. we got to learn these lessons. We got to move forward. You know, it's, it's, it's really a difficult conversation to have, right? Because the reality is it's not, it's not going to stop, right? Cyber criminals are not going to stop. The attempts are going to go up. Those numbers are going to go up. And like, like I mentioned in the intro, right? I feel like the, the only metrics that we have control over is the impacts of those attacks on our organizations. And I know that sounds very generic, right? But not having, for example, a lens into when those attacks are successful and someone's in your environment is monumental from a cost perspective. I mean, the, the numbers are staggering. I love reading the reports, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'm in pre-sales, right? So of course I love reading these reports, but they're staggering and, they, and they, they, they cause a lot of attention. I mean, 108 days, the difference between in, in time it took to detect an attack when you have AI involved versus not. I mean, last year, right, the statistic that I, that I could not stop repeating um, was 277 days. That was the time on average it took for organizations to detect a cyber criminal in their network, 277 days. That's insane, right? And now you, you, and the, 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 the joint statistic was you take that from 277 to 200 and you save yourself $1.5 million. It's like, I mean, the, the budget should just be allocated by the threat, right? But unfortunately, it's, it's not, it's really not that simple. You know, it's, Richard made the comment earlier about that east to west or, or the, 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 you know, what are you doing if you don't have this kind of tool? You go into each machine, you're doing forensics on each machine, which takes hours and days, right? But if you have a, NDR solution deployed with the ability to store historical data, your forensics are all there for you. I mean, and, and you're just, you're, you're yeah. killing time in which a cyber criminal could be effective, you know? Yeah, and I think this is where, yeah. where responsibles don't want to hear that, man. Come on. Because, you know, the yeah. average cost is 3.3 million. I'm sorry, Richard. I just had to get that out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's kind of strange. But I think there's, there's, so there's opportunities. I think AI can actually help solve this problem. It's not going to be a panacea of you know a silver bullet, 
But the converse of that is, yeah, there's there's also threat actors who are going to start using AI to to attack us, to be offensive. And so you have to, it becomes an arms race. I, we were, I was just talking to other security professionals about this. It's going to be an absolute arms race. And if, if you're not adopting or looking at a something something AI, you know, specific or at least learning and behavioral, you're, first of all, we don't have enough security analysts in the world. That's that's a problem right. we all know. And we're going to have to we're going to have to lean on machine learning. And without the data, without that visibility, how do you know? And I think it's still again we're going back to the basics. Is but back to what you're saying, Scott, what are the core controls that we need to have in place? You have to have good visibility, you have to have good authentication, you have to have good backups, you have to have a good IR plan. You know, all those things are monumental and it and they're table stakes for any program. But I still see organizations struggle with that. But you know what? The core gap is visibility, right? It, it's truly visibility because we know that the MITRE attack framework has detailed the threat actor steps, every single step from reconnaissance to getting in there, elevated privileges, those processes don't change. And so, or the, the methods don't change. We know that they wanna scan the network to do what? To find that high value storage, because that's the value that they wanna extract. And so there's processes by which they, you know, the steps by which they move through the network. And so if you have visibility, and you can actually see every single step that goes on, that's gold. I mean, that's literal gold. And, this is where the gap is, and I think I think organizations need to say, look, I need to make a strategic investment in a key area to gain the visibility that I don't have. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, having that, I mean, the visibility seems well. It doesn't seem to be. It is the theme of this conversation, right? Network observability, having a lens into what's going on, and, and of course, like I mentioned earlier, you'd be shocked as to, to find how many uh, organizations don't, right? Now, what's the, the what's the percentage, Frank? How many organizations you know? don't? I don't. I don't have a statistic for you. But it's um, probably not half, right? They don't have well, visibility. From I can many, say. Uh, sorry, what was it, Andy? Go ahead. No, no, no. Um, just recent stats. We're looking at about ninety percent of orgs. Take, for instance, in the Americas alone, um, doesn't have any kind of a network detection product that gives them the level of visibility from an AI or machine learning standpoint mm -hmm. to look at behaviors. They, they just plain don't have them. Did you see my big sigh over there of frustration yeah. that I just put you? That I got like I just couldn't even hide, and you know, and here I am, and you know, and and this is the frustration point because here I am, like I'm jumping up and down in 2016, and I'm going, guys, you know, I'm banging pots on the wall, going. You know, core critical controls, visibility. This is causing 90, this is causing on all these data breaches. And I want to make sure that everyone hears me correctly on the majority of the data breaches, ransomware, you contact law enforcement, okay? Business email compromise, you, you contact law enforcement. You control the narrative, but you do not control the narrative when law enforcement contacts you and makes a victim notification to you saying that data has been exfiltrated out of your network or a 250 megabyte RAR file went out of your network and you're asking all these questions, did it go to China, did it go to Russia, and the FBI really agent can't really tell you where it went to, that's not a good situation. And it all comes down to the visibility. And here I am, what, seven, eight years later, still having the same conversation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're going to see, I mean, obviously speaking, right, we're going to see AI be a, a major push, right? NDR, uh, as powered by AI, be a major push. Um, and we're seeing more governance over the kind of things that, that force organizations to implement these solutions. So what do, you, what do you guys think about the SEC ruling on, uh, I think it was July 26th, um, SEC adopts rules on cybersecurity risk management strategy, governance, and incident disclosure by public companies. How do you guys feel about that? Well, I'm familiar with the safeguard ruling, which is the, which is the one that concerns me for the small and medium-sized businesses. Because remember now, uh, uh, well, no, no, you're talking SEC. I'm talking the FTC. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. But, but but still, now everybody is like, that's just another layer of pressure. That's just another layer of strain on organizations. 
And Richard, you're, you're a CISO. Yeah. What is the? What do you think the average CISO feels besides the fact that why am I doing this for a living? You know, what does he feel when he sees these new regulations going across? Yeah, I mean, it's every. Um, so I, I think Tim Brown just got Tim Brown CISO SolarWinds has been uh, you know notified by the SEC. The SEC is putting their pressure on on CISOs, and it is. I, I, you know, I've talked to my my peers. It's making it a very tough job and an unattractive position to be in. I'm being completely honest. I think it's a good thing that we're having a conversation and that they want to put some regulation and rules to be transparent, which we all, I think, especially a public company, you want to be transparent to your customers and to your investors. Absolutely agree with that. But now you're you're putting timetables and every situation is different. You, having yeah. a four day turnaround time, um, and I don't even want to get into this, even just the term breach, what does that mean as in the law? That is not clearly defined. So that, does that mean, is it a phishing attack? So if, if, if say like, Frank, you, I just notified you, you got phished, your account was taken over. Is that a breach? Nowhere in the law defines that right now. And it's very mm -hmm. ambiguous and it's, and it puts a lot of pressure on, on CISOs like myself and, and the industry. And what, what I'm also going to, you know, what's also going to end up happening it's just because it's an SEC and you're a public company, these become de facto standards for non-public companies. So yes. the pressure is going to be yeah. on private companies as well. Yes. Um, but yeah, as a CISO, it's tough. Uh, we're in a really interesting um, environment and you know, as sort of evolution of the CISO role. And yeah, we're working through it. But uh, it's it's something that we we constantly talk about. I mean, and from yeah. my point, I'm uh, sorry, Andy. Go. On. I was just going to make a simple point. In one regard, and this is just my humble opinion, it's a privileged position to be connected to the internet because now if you do get breached, whatever that term means, if you've got someone that's controlling an aspect of your network, now you are actually part of the tool set that that threat actor is going to leverage to attack someone else. And, and that's a dangerous position to be in, right? And so I, I don't generally love regulation but there needs to be a level of standard that says, listen, if you're going to operate, you need to do it in a responsible, protected manner. Yeah. You know, you know what scares me about this? So a lot of these publicly traded companies are going to run out. And instead of going out and getting visibility into their network, they're going to go out and pay big money for someone to be on the board that has cyber experience. And I've come across some of these people, you know what I mean? So that that's where it just becomes a really, really challenging situation. And, you know, and part of the job of what you all do is, you know, having to manage up, having to sit here and having to explain the investment to your organization, because I have lots of friends who are CISOs. I, I like to joke and say I run a CISO support group in Nashville where we're always having beers. And besides them looking for new jobs, and I'm like, where are you going? You're already topped out. You know, what, what, do, you, what do you want, another company to go to? Everyone has the same complaint. My upper management tells the world that they get it, but they really don't. And everybody's saying you have to do more with less. There's no, and that's a challenge. I'm glad. I'm glad you made that point, right? Because I, I was gonna. I was waiting for my opportunity to make the unpopular um, statement, right? In that, we'll what, that. I hope, well, what, what I hope being the hopeless optimist, right, is that these these sort of rulings, right, and, and you know, I understand what comes with the intervention portion of things, but I hope that these sort of rulings assist CISOs and security professionals in in justifying upstream the, the, the budgetary requirements, right? Because that, that's the biggest thing. I mean, these numbers have been astronomical for years, right? Everybody sees them. And, and in my space, right, positioning these products and, and being a technology evangelist around cybersecurity, um, the, the go-to thought is, well, nothing actually justifies budget like a breach, right? <laughs> I mean, but we want our customers to want to think about being proactive. And so I'm hoping that CISOs will be equipped to this, you know, equipped yeah, with. I love, I, I love the idea of bringing the standards, making sure, look, if for any public company, what is what are the biggest risks if you look at all the 10Ks out there? You're going to see financial risk, market risk, and what else? Cybersecurity. Yeah. And there's not enough transparency around investments around cybersecurity. I'm actually advocating 
that we should have that in 10K, right? How much is a company actually investing, in, uh, you know, percentage-wise into cyber? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, nobody knows where to start, Rich, and that's really kind of, you, you know, that's why, you know, I love what we're doing. I love what you guys are doing, because at the same time, as the cybercrime problem goes up, we keep spending more and more money. And we keep going over and, and, you know, so what does it mean when we keep spending more money and the problem gets worse? We're not doing things right. And if 90 yeah. percent on my side easily could be prevented, the other 10 percent is really the core controls, which is visibility. Everyone's buying all these other shiny. Everyone's chasing after shiny objects that sound really good. Sure. Well, I think go, sorry, I had this conversation the other day, just like um, the CFO, the CFO didn't that role never existed on the board how many years ago, right? Enron happens, right? They, they found out that uh, accountants were cooking the books and then the CFO finally gets a seat at the table. Why? Because finance is a major risk. I eventually see that the CISO is going to have that same type of uh, notoriety, right? Like that recognition because that is a major risk. And you're absolutely right, Scott. Like, how well are you spending that money? And I think there has to be some transparency around that. Yeah, that What's has to be the response. One? Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, what is the number one problem on the internet? It's data breach. Mm -hmm. It's breach. And so if that's the truth, um, that's an opinion, then mm -hmm. there needs to be a strategic investment. And I think the CISO does need to have that privileged seat. I mean, they're, they're the key yeah. um, player in this realm. Yeah. It, Investment transparency as a as an advocate for allocated additional budget is going to have to be the only response to that 10.5 trillion dollar impact cyber attacks you know projectively have on the on the world in 2025. I mean, we those numbers are transparent. <laughs> They'll never stop being transparent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I think we're all pretty much in agreement on, on these points here, right? So go ahead, Scott. Sorry, do you have a comment? Oh no, and, and today and, and and it's like you know. I mean, look at this, like ransomware used to be the end goal of the threat actor. Now ransomware is just a byproduct of a data breach. Mm -hmm. And and remember, nobody ever wanted to call ransomware a data breach. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I, let me, I want to also clarify, Scott, when you say ransomware, and I'm, I'm seeing it being used interchangeably, it's not just, hey, I, we've installed, a threat actor installs a mal malicious program on your environment and hold you ransom to that. It's also holding ransom of your data that they exfiltrated and and you know and extorting you to pay a certain amount of money to get back that data. And a promise that they're gonna delete it, right? <laughs> and on, again, there's honors amongst thieves, right? Of course. So oh, you know, and uh, luckily Frank made this what a three hour discussion that we're having today, right? You know, oh, yeah, but that's all going. We're having fun here. Yeah, hey, <laughs> listen, man. and you know, because that's that that's the whole thing. And I, I just remember, you know, and I had a I was in a panel in Vegas, and there's like it's a new type of threat. It, it's this new thing called double extortion. And then I, I just, you know, my Tourette's kicks in because <laughs> here I am in 2017 talking about Dark Overlord who was the threat actor that got into the dental place in New York City. And, you know, they came over and they said, hey, we're going to show you we've been we already made backups. Ha ha. And he said, well, I stole your information and he put it to a pastebin account. So, you know, that's a whole nother thing. And now we're seeing that in ransomware as a service is really you know, and with the use of artificial intelligence, here's my biggest nightmare. The Nigerians who have perfected social engineering, which is working better than malware, because now what ends up happening is you guys come in, you protect the entire infrastructure. The threat actors go to LinkedIn, they find everyone in your company, and then they send them a message on LinkedIn and they try to social engineer them. Once the Nigerians figure out how to do ransomware as a service, we better all hide. You know, and, and, and that's, I mean, man, what a key point, right? That, that Rich mentioned it earlier today. That's the importance of, of, of East to West. You know, in, in reality, in, while we're talking about ransomware attacks, nowadays, you, you know, a majority of customers, or we're not, I wouldn't say a majority of customers, a lot of customers have backup and replication tools in place, right? 
And that's great, right? You preserve your data, right? If the threat actor gets your data out of the network, they give you a ransom, you have something to fall back on. However, just the fact that the threat actor can prove that they got in your system nowadays is enough for a ransom. I mean, organizations do not want going into the public internet notifications that, hey, we got in, and here's proof that we got in. Maybe they didn't get anything valuable. Maybe they got you know, somebody's calendar. But the point is, is just the fact that they got in now, they can hold that truth for ransom. We will publish proof that we got into your network. And you know, not sadly, but the reality is today, that, that's enough to convince people not to invest with your company or, or pull out investment or not to do business with your company. Or they can, and completely, well, and they can completely take you out instead of just holding for ransom. You know, it's okay, pay me this or whatever, or else I'm going to destroy your environment, which is completely valid. And, yeah, and that's or your reputation, right? Reputation, they take down 10,000 servers, whatever. Your, your ability to operate as a business um, ceases. Yes, yes, okay. And I'm going to ask you guys, and I'm going to throw this scenario out for you guys, because remember, a lot of times, how is ransomware being distributed? Somebody clicks on a link in an email, and the executable is installed, and that executable has to phone home. So let me ask all of you, how would visibility into your network, how would that prevent that from happening? Oh, absolutely. See, see now, here's the thing, right? When, when you deploy a solution that is monitoring your north to south, east to west traffic, right? Not only are we able to detect in a um, signatureless manner when a, a threat actor begins to do its discovery and get the lay of the land inside of an environment, right? But when a threat actor has successfully infiltrated a device in the environment and uses that device as the contact point to the outside, right? Exfiltrating data or even communication points to the outside, we call that out. That's anomalous behavior. When that threat actor begins to speak to known command and control centers, right, IPs that are populate on reputational databases, that's easy to call out. Furthermore, even if those IPs are not known command and control centers or blacklisted IPs, the very nature of the way that that threat actor transfers or moves data in inside and out of your network is something we can call out. Now, that's, I mean, that's that's AI built into NDR, right? That's behavioral patterns. That's machine learning. That's heuristics. If you don't have that kind of tool, good luck. I mean, outbound traffic yeah, to the internet is open for everyone, right? Or yeah, not everyone, the big but... one is like beaconing, right? Beaconing to your command and control system. That's oh, an yeah. easy rule to, to detect, right? You're seeing pings that happen every so often to an IP address that's never been pinged before. What's going on? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah right. it, could right. be, it could be a little bit here. It could be next month a little bit more. Here's a question I get all the time. I go, hey, you know, hey, do we pay the ransom? Do we not pay the ransom? And I'm like, that's the law. That's the wrong question. Because at the <laughs> end of the day, when you get hit with the ransomware, everybody pays. OK, oh, yeah. because you put into that situation where they stole your information. OK, how your organization can't survive very, very long without that. And now from what you guys are telling me is if they just would have had good visibility, that would have helped prevent it from happening. If I, if I made that statement correct. Yeah. You, you know, Scott, we have, we have a video um, out on, on YouTube that me and Andy um, did, and we, we um, selectively titled it held for ransom to pay or not to pay. Right? And it takes you through how our product detects ransomware detections and so on and so forth. But because I want to, I want to, we want to highlight a point, right? If you have the tools in place, right? that provide the forensic platform by which you can determine exactly what a threat actor did inside of your environment. And maybe the notifications were turned off, so it took its full course, right? Um, but you can determine what a threat actor did inside of an environment, exactly what they touched, even down to the triggering packet captures when data is exfiltrated. So you know specifically what, what was exfiltrated. Truthfully speaking, um, aside from reputation, the choice to pay that ransom becomes a choice. Right now, at the end of the day, the majority of customers don't. They don't really know what they got and whether or not they're still in their environment. Yeah, because they don't have a lot. This is such a key gap that has to be solved because the tool sets that are being used today aren't solving the problem. The evidence proves that. And your source of truth to understand what's happening in your environment is absolutely essential. You, you better know every single endpoint, who they're talking with, when they're talking, what are they talking about, <laughs> everything. You don't yeah. have that. Yeah, Andy, I've been, you know, being 
part of a few incidents or a team test, the very first question is when we know a device has been compromised, what's the blast radius? Was there lateral movement? What was taken? What did they touch? I want to know if it's a small, small blast radius or if it was wide. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. And so you have this I-10 tool that looks at all the devices on the end. You see how much bandwidth is flowing out the network interface card, but you don't know who they're talking to. So you got to have that level of visibility. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Um, and so, man, we're, 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 we're getting close to time, but I really just want to it keep on like going. we've only been talking 10 minutes. What do you mean? I, I, oh, I know. This is this, we, you know, we're going to keep on going, and maybe uh, we'll get in trouble with marketing, but that's all right. They'll forgive us. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Scott, I want to ask a fun question, right, for, for those viewers who are primarily intrigued that, that uh, you were with the FBI. Um, how often are threat actors caught following a cyber attack investigation? And why do you think that is? Why do you yeah. got to ask me like a depressing question to end this? <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, when I was a young FBI agent, if you asked me to define the role of the FBI, it was easy. Bad people did bad things to good people. I've worked with state and local cops. We put bad guys in jail. In theory, it works great for bank robberies, fugitives, drug dealers, you name it, but not cyber criminals. Because even in, and I got sucked into this in 1997 because I had the most advanced skills of any of my peers. I knew how to use AOL and Windows 95. So I became the cyber guy in the office. And I just said, hey, this is going to be really easy. We just get grand jury subpoenas and we trace IPs and we put bad guys in jail. And then cyber took a very sinister turn probably in 2004 where we start seeing these foreign entities, you know, foreign threat actors and organized criminal groups, and now the convergence of that together. So who are the threat actors? Some of the countries that we don't have the best relationships with. And the FBI and the Secret Service do an amazing job of tracking down the bad guys. But in a lot of situations, we can't get the money back. We can't put these bad guys in jail. We can indict them. So if they ever go to Disney World, they'll go to jail. But that's not going to stop things. We have to take steps into our own hands to really educate ourselves to prevent these things from happening. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Um, any, any thoughts? Any other thoughts? Anybody on that? Questions? From you, Rich, Randy. Well, I got a question. Um, in your experience in the last how many years, what are your thoughts on nation-sponsored attacks? Not nation-state, but nation-sponsored. Mm -hmm. Give me a little bit more detail when you say nation. Using mercenaries or criminal groups, right, as funding them, right, to do attacks. But they may not be doing still, it directly from. I still kind of look at it as one big. There's the U.S. that we can put handcuffs on people, okay? And then there's the rest of the world, which is very challenging. I spent about a month over in Toronto, and it and even though it was right across the border, going through legal process is very, very challenging, requiring to go through the Department of Justice. So we're starting to see that. And now, you know, through the day, and we even talk about the dark web. There's so much stuff. Um, there's so much stuff that's out there that, you know, that it's making it easy for people to uh, attack us. So that's the big thing. We got to prevent it. Yeah, you made a good point. I think that's also the major difference from 10, 15 years ago. The cost or the barrier to entry, right, to be an attacker is so low, right? Yeah. When I first got into this, I, you know, my first, you know, my first job uh, in security was pen tested, and to learn how to hack at that time or you know do white hat penetration testing, it took a while. Now I can go on Udemy, I can go on YouTube, I have hack me boxes that you can basically subscribe to. It's just the cost, you know, the cost and the barrier to entry is so low. It, it just it it just it scares the living hell, hell out of me, um, and it's not hopeless. It's not ho listen. It's not hopeless. We can take steps. We can do these things, uh, and try to stay one step ahead of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm trying so, to end on a positive. 
Health Research. Sure, absolutely. Let's uh, let's just shift gears before we wrap up for a second, Andy. I want to. I have a question for you, right? So, so through, through your experience engaging with with partners, with with SecOps service providers, with with Progress Flowmont customers, what are some of the hurdles that you see um, SecOps professionals are trying to overcome? Anything come to top of mind that you can share a little bit about? Budget is a big one. Uh, the the people that are actually trying to solve the problems are constrained. They don't have the requisite tool sets like a visibility tool set to give them the eyeballs. And so when an event happens, kind of like what Rich was saying earlier, got to look through logs. I got to I got to trace the system and find out what was talking to what. And goodness, that's a needle in a haystack challenge. The the you know the golden scepter as it is, or you know the privileged position to be in is to have visibility. To, to literally have visibility into the environment, see every endpoint, uh, and you and and what we see is when we engage with various customers that have been hit with ransomware or have had some kinds of breach in some manner, but you know data wasn't exfiltrated, that they are struggling greatly to solve this problem, and that's why they're engaging with us because you know the kind of tool sets that that we you know provide the customer base. Yeah. Yeah, you, you really, I mean, you really covered that well. I, I, I would completely agree uh, and add, right? Um, a large amount of our customers are, are, are tasked with doing everything that we've described today and, and addressing visibility and observability across multi-platform, right? Hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud multi-cloud, on-prem, um, virtualized infrastructures and such like that. And so I would add, right, that one of the alleviations or, or the PowerPoints that our, that our customers identify and even Progress Flowmine as a solution is a single pane of glass across platforms, right? Um, instead of task being tasked with, with monitoring with multiple different tools because you're in this cloud platform, and but hey, we're also in, in this cloud platform and we're gonna use their tools as well, and that we're on-prem and the, you know, these are hybrid applications you're troubleshooting and chasing the same problem across multi-platforms and multi-solutions. Having one tool that ties it all together, I think, is a is a major challenge point that I that I see with our customers. So, um, we are coming up on time here. Um, I, I want to ask Scott if if you could just close us out with some with some thoughts, and then I'll I'll jump back in to announce the QA. We covered so much here today. We went over we. Yeah, you know, but, it, but it was great conversation. I'm sure there's a lot of questions in the audience. I want people to realize that, look, this is what I've seen during my career. Bad guys get your stuff, law enforcement's not getting it back. We talked about putting the bad guys in jail. We talked, and one of the things, you know, on that portion from the core critical controls, it's the lack of visibility. And, you know, the lack of visibility about outbound traffic and now even the things that I've put together today, just listening from what you do, you know, I'm having visibility will help you prevent ransomware. So I really appreciate you guys. I love being a part of this. This was just an unbelievable discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to extend that to the rest of you. Um, Andy, thank you for joining us, Rich. Really appreciate you taking the time, Scott. I mean, it's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to many, many more of these sessions where we can really just have a, a digging on some of the stories that you have. Um, I'm sure that we could fill an entire session with just that. But with that said, for all the attendees, thank you for joining us, for taking the time out to um, to not only listen in, but we, we hope that you extract some, some key information that this was fruitful for you as it was for us. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of time now for a QA. Um, so just shortly, we'll be able to receive some of your questions and answer them live. Thanks again for joining. Let's just dive into some of these questions. We unfortunately won't have time to answer too many, but we'll get through quite a few here. Um, and then obviously, uh, if you have any questions, we'll circle back with you guys. Of course, feel free to reach out to us and we can dig in. So let me, I guess this is less of a question, just a, um, a statement here. Miguel, thank you for your statement on uh, commentary and, and outlining that testing, simulation, blocking, and NDR are, um, are equivalent, right? And so just to clarify the statement that I made, earlier detection and response is more important than blocking and prevention. That's a quote from uh, Gartner analyst, Neil McDonald. Now, we certainly believe security is multi-layered as it should be, um, but what we see in the field is that there's a disproportionate amount of attention placed on blocking and prevention tools, right? So when a threat actor circumvents your perimeter or your endpoint protection solutions, your very next objective is to prevent operational impact and cost, right? So without an NDR, this is, 
impossible to rapidly and effectively do. And this is why I agree with that statement. Detection and response is, is more important than blocking prevention. Of course, it's not meant to take anything away from the importance of, of implementing your perimeter security devices, your endpoint security devices, as well as conducting testing, simulation, um, and blocking, of course, right? So uh, I really appreciate your statement there. Um, Andy, um, this, this this question I have here, I think uh, you'd be the best candidate to answer here. So the question is, how can you ensure the resiliency of your network detection and response system against emerging cyber threats such as zero day attacks and advanced persistent threats? Okay, good deal. That's kind of like a two part of there, zero day attacks. If you're signature based, you got problems <laughs> because the second a zero day attack comes in, you don't have a signature to, to mitigate the risk. And so you have to you have to think about the fact that the MITRE attack framework defines the methods by which a threat actor is going to come into the network and carry out the respective uh, activities to, to then harvest the data and exfiltrate it. So you have to have a system that's AI machine learning based that looks at specific behaviors that are in a network. And it doesn't matter if there's a signature um, created because it's all behavioral based. And so you leverage a tool that has that AI ML and that helps you to figure out what's going on in the environment and you can mitigate. That's the whole notion of NDR, right? Network detection behavior and then what? R for response. And so the Flowmon product does or the NDR product do integrate with these third party tools that allow you to quarantine uh, zero day types of attacks. But what about advanced persistent threats? And that's the that's the notion of look. A threat actor's in your environment, they're trickling data. Next month, they're going to do a TCP SYN scan to figure out where the port and protocol is for that storage repository. And then the next month, they'll try and get elevated privileges. That's, that's the advanced persistent threat. So you have to have a tool that allows you to look over a time series of events like a DVR and be able to see exactly what that particular uh, infected device is doing over that time series of events. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. Um, next question we have here, and I think I'll take this one. How can you effectively integrate network detection and response capabilities with other security technologies, such as endpoint detection and response or security information and event management systems? Uh, great question, right? Um, we firmly believe that the NDR tool that you put in place um, carrying out and doing its signature list uh, detection of threats inside of the environment should certainly have the ability to integrate with your ED, um, EDR solutions as well as your perimeter solutions. And this, this kind of ties into the initial statement um, shared by Miguel on, on importance here, right? Because at the end of the day, if something circumvents your perimeter or your endpoint, the NDR solution that's sitting in your environment will do your detection, right, if, if configured correctly. Now, it should also be able to then integrate with those perimeter or endpoint security solutions so that the response aspect is carried out by the devices responsible for those responses. And a lot of response commentary there, right? But um, the point being, right, is, is the, the more ability to integrate and execute custom actions or executables um, in order to handle responses ultimately um, results in our ability to say, hey, SecOps engineer, not only did we detect the threat, but we took care of it. Right. And this is truly the AI approach to, to, to handling these threats inside of a network in a in a um, rapid manner, right? Uh, it's, it's, I think that's super important to do. Um, furthermore, right, without network section and response, your, your perimeter tools are limited to perimeter visibility and your endpoint tools are limited to endpoint visibility. So the threat is not addressed until, of course, that threat knocks the door of the endpoint, right? And so it, using that as an example, we can make sure that, or we can ensure that endpoint detection and response tools have the opportunity to be proactive as opposed to reactive to threats um, with the information that it gets from an NDR. So great question there. Um, okay, so this um, this next one here, Rich, uh, feel free to, to jump in on this one or Andy, either one of you can answer this. What are the key challenges associated with deploying and managing network detection and response solutions across a large and complex enterprise network and how can you overcome these challenges? Yeah, that's Rich. Uh, so I think the challenge is understanding your architecture understanding your network environment, critical assets, um, and then operationalizing it, I think is one of the biggest challenges. It's not just getting a solution, but you also have to have uh, the people behind it to support it, to maintain it, to watch it, to monitor it. And so having, you know, people process technology um, and those, you know, that, that triad of 
of solutions and you know and yeah support i think we'll 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 definitely give you that coverage but yeah you coming in with an ndr i would say start off small get it uh start off with maybe a, a data center or a regional environment depending on how big your environment is get get familiar with the tool uh learn how to operationalize it and then from there you can scale awesome rich thank you very much um now Scott, I, I don't have a question here from the audience, but I, I do have an additional question that I want to ask you to wrap things up here. Um, and, and thank you again for your participation. So, you know, we talked a, little, a lot about you know response and network detection and response and, and how to really handle the the, the threats or, or how those solutions handle threats coming into your network. But on the forensic side of things, right, when when the FBI gets involved and in, in, in participating in an in analysis or to address things. How important um, do you believe a uh, historical um, record of a network detection responses events and, and, and visualizations is important to um, the forensic process and actually identifying the, the, the threat actor or effectively mitigating the threat? It, it's super important in today's environment. And now with there's so many different threats out there, you, you just need to have that in place. And, you know, the challenge is, is we don't have enough technically trained people to do that. And that's why it's important that, you know, you can have that capability like you talked about that. I like the analogy, the DVR, where you can just recall everything and see it, because that's where you're going to find those little bits of digital breadcrumbs that will, you know, have that little bit of intelligence just to be able to help that and then to also help your organization to prevent this from happening again. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Thanks again for all the panelists here. We're going to wrap up there um, give you guys some time to kind of process this information. Feel free to reach out to us at um, www.fullmon.com. We're happy to, to have these conversations, provide demos, dig in deeper with you and have these discussions. We hope this was fruitful for you. Again, thank you for attending and have a great day. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks all.